Hi guys, so in my last video, a lot of people pointed out that the knight could go to a lot more squares than the six I was showing. Like this one. Boom, boom, boom. So why doesn't it highlight that square? Well, good news, as of this new update, it does. Let's move this knight to the corner and look at all the valid options it can go to. There's 10 of them. And check that out, two down and one across, and now it's there. In my opinion, these six destinations are obviously a knight's path away, but these four, not so much. Like, I'd assume these two would be a diagonal move away, like a bishop. But to get there, the knight actually just has to move one down first, and two across second. And then these other two look like they're two tiles away via rook motion, but like we saw before, the knight can just go two down on the other color, and then slide one across to cross the border. That night corner fix is just one of the 12 updates I've made to Rubik's Chest in the last couple weeks. What's update number two? A new piece called the Amazon. The Amazon is this baby dragon with a crown and it moves like a queen plus a knight. So it can go orthogonally, diagonally, or in a two to one path like this. I was originally going to use the Amazon logo as the visual for the piece, but then I saw on Wikipedia that Amazons are also called dragons, which I thought was just a cuter choice anyway. Amazons are actually so powerful that if they land on the center of a 5x5 face like this one, they can actually access every tile on that face. Like take a look at this, he's in the center and he can hit every single square here. But because he's in the center, there's not much bleed to other faces. But now that we're looking at a 5x5 Rubik's Cube, that brings me to update 3 out of 12. Customizable chess cube size. In the upper left, where you see the number 7, simply replace that with what you want, like a 2, hit new custom game, and you get a 2x2 two two Rubik's Cube. This is the smallest one, of course, because a 1x1 one one wouldn't make any sense. But you can go up to a 3x3, three three, which is the standard Rubik's Cube which looks, you know, exactly like solving a normal Rubik's Cube. There's a middle slice just like that. Up to 4x4 four four like this. 5x5 five five like this. Next up we have the 6x6 six six like this. And finally we arrive at the standard 7x7. Seven seven. This is the board size you're given by default if you don't specify a size. But you might notice that the 7x7 seven seven Rubik's Cube doesn't quite look like the standard 8x8 chessboard. I chose an odd layered Rubik's Cube because it makes the center tiles more impervious to diagonal attacks from other sides. So for example, this black bishop cannot attack this white king unless it actually gets onto the white face here because, well, you just can't attack from a center line that hits the diagonal like that. But if you really care to see an exact 8x8 chessboard on every face, you simply type up here 8, click new custom game, and there you go! Every face of this cube now looks exactly like a chessboard. You can go all the way up to a 20x20, 20 20, but um, the frame rate's not great. But what does it look like to take a hand and turn a layer of this 20x20? 20 20? Like that. They're all going for a ride! On a big cube like this, Splatoons have huge range if they're in a big swath that's undisturbed, like this orange one here. Speaking of Splatoons, and I know they're called Inklings, update 4 is that I made them more powerful. In the past, Splatoons could slide through similarly colored regions, but not attack enemy pieces in that region. Well, now they can. And here's my reasoning why. At the beginning of the game, the Splatoons are incredibly powerful because they have essentially an entire uninterrupted face of places they could go to, like this. But as the game progresses and people start using their hands to scramble the cube, the Splatoon's abilities get less and less powerful. See, at this point in time, roughly three or four turns in, some Splatoons like this one are already incredibly handicapped. There's only two white tiles in this region. Other Splatoons like this black one literally have nowhere to go except for the default one tile move. So if this is what a day in the life of the Splatoon is mid game, Imagine how encumbered they'll be by endgame when the board is entirely scrambled. And so the Splatoon's new stealth kill is my way of balancing out that issue. By the way, I also changed the way that Splatoon's search the move space from recursive, which results in depth first search and humorously long journeys, to iterative with a first in first out queue. And that results in a breadth first search that guarantees Splatoon's pick one of the shortest journeys. I figured this is supposed to be a computer science channel after all, so here's some CS for you. Anyway, moving on to update number five, anti-Splatoon pieces. When I was playtesting Rubik's Chess with TT Guy 10,000, we noticed Notice that Splatoons got less and less useful over time. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a piece that did the exact opposite and got more useful over time? That would be cool. So, 
What Splatoon spelled backwards? Newt Alps. And in fact, my initial prototype for this piece was a newt, meaning a music note. But I realized there's already a cute cartoon character who says newt newt and lives in a snowy environment like the Alps, and that's Pingu. So now Pingu's in my game, but how does he move? Well, you know how the Splatoon can access any of its four orthogonal neighbors if and only if they're the same color, and that process happens repeatedly, indefinitely? The newt newt is just the opposite. It can access any of its four orthogonal neighbors if and only if they're different colors, and that happens repeatedly indefinitely. Meaning, at the start of the game, when the neighboring tiles are nearly all the same color, the Newt Newt is essentially useless, but once neighboring tiles start being all sorts of different colors later in the game, well, uh oh. Yeah, this resulted in Newt Newts being way too powerful, essentially able to attack 90% of the board from anywhere. You know what? I'm ditching this recursive anti-Splatoon maneuver for the Newt Newts. It's time to give them something more balanced and not so overpowered. So here's what I came up with. Now, Newt Newts like this one basically act like handicapped Amazons, so they can travel in all the 16 directions that Amazons can, a queen plus a knight, but they can only keep going if the tiles change color every step of the way. So from, say, this location, if the Newt Newt wants to move right, it can go here because it goes green, black, green, but it can't go any further because green to green is not allowed. So we can move the Newt Newt here or something, and from this location, the Newt Newt can actually move four tiles diagonally because it goes green, black, green, white, red, like this, and every step of the way, the Newt Newt has gone to a different colored tile. But at the end game, when the board is more scrambled, Newt Newts become almost as powerful as Amazons themselves, able to travel really far, because just look at this, and it can even travel all the way to here to kill this black queen. And the Newt Newts are at the peak of their usefulness, while these Splatoons up here are pretty much useless. Update number 6. The Rubik's Cube is now filled with solid wood. I don't know why it was hollow before, because it looks ugly when it's hollow, but it's not hollow anymore. Look at that luscious color! So beautifully brown! Update number 7. Pawn Promotion. One of the most iconic features of the pawn in normal chess is that it can promote to any of the other pieces when it reaches the opposite rank. In Rubik's Chess, there is the concept of pawns reaching the opposite face, but I wanted to get a bit more creative. So here's how it works. Pawns can promote if and only if they land on a tile of the enemy color. So if you're a white pawn, you can promote once you land on a black tile. And if you're a black pawn, you can promote once you land on a white tile. And this allows for the hands to have a much bigger influence on when pawns can promote, because it's not just a matter of moving, moving forward seven tiles, it's also about is the cube scrambled in such a way that there are enemy tiles right in front of your pawns? As for the promotion options, I have pawn, knight, bishop, rook, hand, splatoon, and newt newt. So I can promote to a rook here, and now that is a rook, and maybe this white pawn wants to become, say, a knight. And of course, these pieces have their new abilities, but you might notice there's three piece types that pawns can't promote to, and it's the king, obviously, the queen, and the amazon. My reasoning for this is that the rook and bishop's powers are just a subset of the queen's, and the queen and the knight's powers are just a subset of the amazon's. There should exist a case where it logically makes sense to pick any of the seven options, but if, say, queen were an option, why would you ever pick the rook? That's why the option to promote to queen just had to go. So in the board's starting configuration, there's this row of pawns here and here, and in my test game with TT Guy, we noticed some interesting formations showing up. Imagine you take this hand and push the pawns down like this, so they end up over here. Clear some pieces out of the way, and then use this hand to bring this side up. Suddenly, all these three white pawns are one move away from promotion, which is a pretty dangerous place to be for black. Because look at that, all these white pieces can just promote, and well, I guess this black pawn can do the same thing. But if you're black and you want to avoid a situation like that, it might be helpful to have a hand on hand to move the powerful band of black tiles away from those pawns. I'm also aware that pawns in regular chess have other special abilities, like being able to move two spaces from its starting point and en passant, where a pawn can capture an enemy pawn by moving one space behind it if it just moved two spaces in the last move. Some viewers recommended that I add that into my version, but I've always felt that these rules are a bit arbitrary and don't make much sense to me. I, I mean, I might get some hate from the chess community, but I decided not to go with that because I like how in this version, you you don't have to keep track of which pawns are in their starting place or move two spaces forward. A pawn's just a pawn. What about update 8? Check warnings. The game now warns you if you're in check and who's causing it. The perpetrator and the king now flash an unignorable red. 
Not much to say here, just that I lost a few games to TT Guy because I didn't realize my king was being attacked, so this warning feature should help prevent accidental losses like that. So like here, you can see you're in check because of that queen, and you can get out of check by killing that queen! What about update 9? There is no update 9. How dare you ask such a ludicrous question. What about update 10? It's undo and redo game history. Take a look at this widget in the lower right. It shows the game history, all 9 moves, and we can navigate through it to go back in time. This allows us to correct mistakes, like let's say it's Black's turn, and Black says, Oh, I don't want to move this rook, but I just want to see where it can go. Oops! And he's like, Oh, I actually want to move this bishop. Then you can actually just go back in time, click on the bishop, and then do it correctly this time. And as expected, if you go backward in history, let's say to move 4 out of 10, and then you make a new move, it's going to create a new branch of the game history, deleting the other branch. So now we're at move 5 out of 5. Because I don't want to create a whole complicated GitHub tree of branches, Basically, you know, use it sparingly, but if you do make a mistake, there is a way to fix that now. What's update number 11? Walled games. You can click up here to create a new walled game. Now, how does this work? Well, basically, in a walled game, hands can still do their Rubik's Cube turning slice moves. So, for example, I can take this black hand here and move it up to drag pieces along with it, but no other piece can ever cross the boundary. So if this white bishop is on this orange face, it can't travel over the edge of the square, to the other faces. It has to stay within this square. Here's my motivation. On a non-walled Rubik's chess game, you can just not use the hands and have all the other pieces move willy-nilly over the surface of a cube, and you can progress and capture pieces and eventually get to checkmate without ever actually doing a Rubik's cube turn, which would be a real shame because it is called Rubik's chess, not just chess on a cube. By walling the faces off from each other, it forces the players to use the hands if they ever want their pieces to interact with each other. If the black pieces want to attack the white king, they're going to have to use hands to get their pieces up there. Forcing a scrambling of the cube, which is what we all wanted. What's the twelfth and last update? Better text input for the board layout. It's pretty underwhelming, but if you click New Standard Game and then open this up, you can see the text code that was used to produce this game, which is helpful because if you want to tinker with it and add, say, a couple new queens on the top, you can just do that hit custom game, and there you go, the queens are added to the board. If you want to add a whole bunch of pawns on the bottom, just spam peas everywhere, because uh, uppercase is black and lowercase is white. And then when you do that, look, there's a whole bunch more pawns on the bottom. What a beautiful sight! If you instead click on new sandbox game, you can see that there's this proportion here, 0.4, which represents the density of squares that are randomly filled with pieces. So if you change this to 0 0.1, then way fewer of the tiles will actually be filled with pieces, but if you change it to 1, then, e then every single tile will have a piece on it, and I don't even know if any of these pieces can really move. I guess you can always capture pieces like that, and then slowly eat your way through it. And you can also just use the hands to make swivel turns like this, but this is a very cramped game, and I wouldn't want to play it. So that's it for the updates, but now let's talk about some fun facts. So on a normal 2D chessboard, bishops never change the color of the tile they're on. We could say that bishops have 50% coverage of the board, but on this board, look at this black bishop. Well, it'll only stay on black tiles if it stays on the top face. But if it ever traverses onto another side, every time it goes over an edge, it'll alternate whether it's on black or white tiles. So now it's on a white tile. Well, from this face, the front face, we can move to the side again to the left face like this, and now we're on black tiles again. So if the black bishop comes up to the top, it'll have gone over an odd number of edges, three. So it went from black tiles on the top, to white tiles on the front, to black tiles on the left, to white tiles on the top which means that bishops can actually hit every tile on the top face and, just by generalization, can hit every tile on this cube ever. And I find it fascinating that a bishop, which you normally think of as half as powerful as a rook, actually has the same coverage of this board as a rook does. Fun fact 2! Can an Amazon reach all tiles on a 2x2 Rubik's Cube in one move? Try to figure it out yourself. Answer revealed in 3, 2, 1, yes! Wait, I mean no, there's two missing. That's so sad. Whoosh! Final fun fact, making a checkerboard pattern. So on the Rubik's Cube, there's this pattern you can make doing a 180 degree turn on all layers like this, this, and this to create a checkerboard pattern. Can we create this checkerboard on this virtual cube? We have a hand right here, so let me move it into the middle slice like this, and we're gonna move this layer 180 degrees. It's a half turn. And then I'll do it over here on this side too. Um, pretty self-explanatory. And that's two out of three axes. Now let's just do the one that does not touch the blue-green side. So this is the white, black, red, orange one. 
and then move this 180 degrees over to the other side like that. And there we go. That's a pretty simple pattern to create, but I think it's just a good way to verify that my code is working and that this Rubik's Cube is functional. But anyway, those are my 12 updates of my Rubik's Chess game, along with some fun facts. Hope you enjoyed watching this crossover of Rubik's Cubes and Chess, and I'll see you all later.